Aloha, and welcome to World of Books, a talk show on books that we think you should read. I'm your host, Mihaela Stoops, and today we're talking about a CIA novel and how to write one. My guest is Elaine Galland. She's the author of the CIA novel titled The Fifth Sea. Elaine has also written another book, Where Lilacs Bloom, and several short stories that were published um, under Maui Writers Inc. Um, under or as part of an anthology by the Stanford University and also in the Conclave uh, Literary Journal. But most importantly, uh, Elaine has hosted a writers group and has managed and uh, moderated the West Maui Book Club for almost 17 years. And I am so thankful for that because it has been an absolute intellectual delight. So Elaine, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you for having me, Nihaila. Well, so let's dive into it and talk about your book, The Fifth C. And I am curious to know, what made you write this book? What inspired you to do it? Was it a person, uh, several persons, a connection with the CIA maybe, um, a story? What was it? It was a newspaper article, Mihaila, in the New York Times on November in November of 2012. And it talked about Russia presenting these diamonds that they had enough inside one crater alone that would flood the market for the next 3,000 years. And I thought that very fascinating. And I, and I, I tried to follow the trail of it. And there was nothing. There, I couldn't find any information prior. There wasn't much after, but I held on to that thought, and I, I just, I, I just could not let that one go. Enough diamonds to fill the world market for the next three thousand years. That was so yeah, and those diamonds are actually, uh, you know, it, it's a, obviously um, this makes the news. Um, these diamonds are currently imported in U.S. through India from Russia, despite um, um, you know, the, the current restrictions. And there are some that think that these are conflict diamonds because the revenues from selling these diamonds on the US market uh, provide the funds to uh, for the war in Ukraine. So are you following that story at all in the news or you know, after you've written the book, basically? <laughs> Well, I tried to follow it for a long time, but the information since 2012 disappeared as quickly as it came into being. Um, Queen Elizabeth had said that she was going to put a coalition together of four different countries to go and verify the information that Russia had given them or had announced in that press release. And from then on, you heard nothing. Now, there's speculation that these diamonds are being used to fund the war against Ukraine. I can't verify that. I, I, I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, Russia has many assets. Why not oil, right? So, but- Yeah, anything can sponsor. It sponsor they sponsor the war. They sponsor the life of Russian citizens. It's, it's too broad. It's too broad, correct. And we do have, the United States has already put sanctions on Russia. So there are no diamonds coming in. There, there shouldn't be as far as what I can research. Maybe there's some, I don't know, but there, there are sanctions on a lot of things that are coming from Russia uh, that are no longer. And also there's the Kimberley, uh, I think it's called the Kimberley process or something like that. And the Kimberley process keeps tabs on, on the whole diamond industry. Okay, so if, if anybody, if you wanna interview somebody about that, find somebody in the Kimberley process because they would be able to tell you specifically whether di these diamonds are being used, but to call them blood diamonds, they're not blood diamonds, they're impact diamonds. They're celestial. Yeah, or conflict. Mm -hmm. yeah, okay. Conflict. Now, conflict. so you have the story on the diamonds. Yes. And, you know, it's a very interesting topic. It catches your attention. And now you have to build your plot line and the characters. So, uh, was there somebody that inspired um, you for Eric Dane, maybe, or for Fanny, or for Glory? Absolutely. The two men, Eric Dane and Fanny Bergen, 
uh, are my two brothers. They were men of action. Um, they were hazmat specialists, um, uh, SWAT team. They were they, 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 they were men of action. They really were. And I wanted to use their character traits as two relatively new CIA officers. Now, of course, in order to have the CIA information, I had to find some CIA officers, right? To use as my, as my background. Well, now he's very small, but within five miles of my home, I found a married couple who were both CIA officers. And they helped me for a long time until um, some medical conditions came up. And then I was at a loss. I, I, was, I didn't know who to, who to talk to after that. But a friend of mine who I play golf with says, oh, my son will help you. And I said, well, is he CIA? She goes, no, but he knows everything about it. He owns a high stakes hostage negotiating company in China or in, in Shanghai. And um, they're doing a movie about his life. He's written three books. He's a West Point graduate. He knows everything and everything. My son will help you. And by golly, did he. I could ask him questions you don't ask normal people, right? So I was really yeah, happy. I mean, as far as I know, you're not a CIA insider. So you must have had help from somebody. I had help with everything. I think, you know, uh, it, it, it's kind of like all writers. It's part of the trade, part of the profession. You have to have reliable resources, reliable contacts, reliable information, reliable research, or you don't have a book. People who live today who write books about the uh, 1600s certainly didn't live there, right? So they're relying on historical facts, records, letters, um, notations that were kept, all, all, all sorts of things. So it's, it's part of the tools of the trade that if you're going to write about something you're not 100% a part of, or even zero part of, you know, you better, you better have all your ducks in a row. You better research. And um, <laughs> your storyline takes us from Washington, D.C., to New York, to Florida, to Paris catacombs, to Siberian diamond mines, to the Caribbean. Now, um, I'm just curious how much of this research was in person and how much was just, you know, reading other books because you're um, that you, you get very descriptive with these locations, which was great because it made the book so genuine to me. And I, tell me where you've been and where you have not. I've been to all of them, but Moscow and Siberia. But again, I needed someone who spoke Russian because I needed to be able to use some Russian words. I wanted them to be exact. And lo and behold, within a mile of my home, I found a woman who was a Russian expert. <laughs> so I went to her and she was a recluse of sorts. And uh, she counseled me on Russia. She showed me photographs. I used Google Maps. I did a lot of research on, on Moscow and on um, on the Siberian Peninsula, where the where, where Papagai craters uh, all is, and that is the smallest of eight craters, by the way. I just want to point that out. If the smallest of eight craters has enough diamonds to flood the market for the next three thousand years, imagine what the other seven are going to do. So, it, I mean, if they all contain diamonds, and we have to assume they do because they were all impacted by meteors, and um, and, and and the C in this actually doesn't mean conflict; it means um, celestial okay because it came from it came right. from the heaven so do you want to talk a little more about the title the fifth c explaining the title? The fifth well c. diamonds are four c's right you got your you got your cut your color your you know whatever carrot the fifth c would be celestial yes that that would be the fifth c now i would do want to talk about a little bit because they are considered a um Lons de Lille type of diamond, which has, uh, uh, they're harder, they're better, they're, um, they're superior to any cubic diamond, um, reportedly up to 58% better. They're better than manufactured diamonds. So this is a hoard of, uh, uh, beyond belief, 
of, of, of diamonds. You know, this is this is really large. I mean, and I can't even describe it. I mean, just think about it. <laughs> yeah, it, it's it's astonishing. I think when you uh, consider the you know scale of it. Now let's go back to your characters and to Eric and Fanny. Um, I got to say I have much appreciation for their friendship and particularly for the way Fanny expresses his friendship, his loyalty and his um, like, you know, sense of danger and jumping in to protect Eric and so on. And is this all for Eric and Fanny or are you thinking of a sequel? Uh, is there more coming to their story? Maybe you're thinking of a story that Fanny is the main character. Or Annette. Annette is one of the female figures in the story. Um, I did think of a sequel because um, Edward Snowden, his last post was Honolulu. Before he did what he did and left the country, right? So that was going yep. to be natural yeah segue into um a second novel i haven't done that because some other stories i've been I, I was working on two stories at the same time one was the fifth c and the other one is where lilacs bloom and one had to come to fruition first i had to i had to stop this duel this this duel that was going on between the two for my attention i had to focus on one to get it done so i did that and then i turned to um where lilacs bloom and started working on that one and then you would think i would get back to the fifth c and do the sequel but now there's a third story i'm working on <laughs> it's caught my it's, that has me absolutely wrapped up and i'm in the middle of that one now and that one is called um tenter hooks and what is that one about tell us well tenter hooks is about a woman who is absolutely stretched to the limit and that's what a tenter hook is. It's it's a when you stretch wool, you put them on tenter hooks on a, on a frame, and you're stretched. So she's stretched to the limit. She's dying of uterine cancer, and um, she wants to travel across the United States to say goodbye to her family without telling them why. She just wants to see them as they are, and that that's what she wants to put into her memory bank before she passes. But they teach her. She learns more about life. Than about death when she makes this journey so it's it's really it really has me all, i mean i get goosebumps sometimes when i'm when i'm writing on it because it just is so uh tender in a way yeah so different genre am i that's what i'm understanding so but back to cia novels you do you think you're going to write another one I might. The common thread between all my novels, though, is the travel. I, I, I'm, a, I'm, I'm a big traveler. I have been a lot of places in the world. Um, you know, what do you do with this information, right? Well, you use it for locations for your characters. So that's what I've done. And that is the common factor for all my books. Um, I think in Where Lilacs Bloom, it's, Bloom, it starts in Chicago. They end up in Rome. They end up in... Um, Siberia and Africa, um, places where there's a lot of danger. And in Tenter Hooks, she's going cross country. So she hits a lot of the places that I have been cross country from Hawaii to Florida. So if we could show Elaine's website, I want to point out to something uh, specifically. If um, our viewers are going to check the website. I'm going to read more about Elaine. One sentence that caught my eye was, my first crib was a suitcase. And I thought, how <laughs> wonderful it is that, you know, one starts traveling at such an early age, and then, you know, they travel their whole life. So obviously travel is part of your life, and that's what you're supposed to do besides writing. Yes, I, I, I agree. It, it was a suitcase. We were, uh, my, my mother was released from the hospital in New Jersey and they were traveling home and got caught in a blizzard, had to stop at her mother's home. So my mother's Samsonite became my, my bed for the night. And so, yes, my first crib was a suitcase. And I've lived out of one ever since. I have 
travel is such a wonderful, wonderful thing. And um, it educates you, it stimulates you, it teaches you about the world, it teaches you how to live, it teaches you um, uh, to appreciate what you have, you know? So I, I, yeah, I, I've been able to travel. I have much appreciation for travel myself, so I resonate with you. Now, going back to matters of the heart that are also quite prominent in your novel, um, and thinking when thinking of Glory, when um, I, I guess she is about to die, Eric kind of ponders over their relationship, and he says something that uh, made me pause, and that was that he understood that beauty fades. And he also understood that beauty conceals. And I've also, I've, I've thought of beauty as distracting somebody, but not as concealing something. So uh, can you expand on that? Well, I can. Um, Eric was falling for her. She was a woman that was outside of the CIA. He felt like he could trust her. He um, wanted to keep her on the side, you know, and out of his um, uh, profession. And she concealed everything from him. Uh, she plays a more central part. Um, I don't want to give away the story because she's not the end all. But, you know, she conceals a great deal. And people do that in, in the shady world of, spy versus spy and that sort of thing. So espionage, you know, uh, they can't reveal their themselves. And so she did conceal herself. She concealed everything. And Eric, being the honest raised guy that he was, was a little naive in that way. He, you know, here he is entering as a, as a, as a rookie CIA officer and he's pulling off these major, uh, well, he's constantly being surprised, number one. And he's, he's forced to handle each situation as it happens. And, but he fails with a woman. He fails. And, um, you know, she just was a little bit smarter. <laughs> Maybe he just put it in there on purpose. <laughs> well, I have hopes for him. That's why maybe in the sequel, he's better in his relationship with women. So. <laughs> well, he's a good guy. You know, he was raised well. His parents were CIA officers. They were high up in the industry. Um, so uh, he has a lot of character. He really does. I really like Eric Dane. And I have to tell you a little funny story because in order to bring these, these men to life, for me, I went to the clothing store and I bought two men's suits. There's the top, the shirts, the jackets, and the tie. And when I was writing as Eric, I would wear Eric's clothes. And when I was writing as Fanny, I would wear Fanny's clothes. So that I had this changeover of, of thought processes because they each had different, like, like Fanny was very casual and Eric was a little more, um, everything was in, they were both, everything was in place, but Fanny was a little more rugged and, and casual and, and Eric was a little more, um, he would wear wingtips where Fanny would wear uh, dockers, you know, or something like that. So they were two very different people. But like my two brothers, one, they admired each other and one followed in the footsteps of the other. So that was an interesting uh, way to portray those characters for, uh, in, in the book, I thought. So I think this is a great suggestion for our viewers that want to know how to write a CIA no novel. Like, try to impersonate your characters. Be <laughs> like them. <laughs> well, you know, people will do what they have to do to get into their character's head. Sometimes it's music. Sometimes it's reading poetry. Sometimes it's something else. For me, it was wearing their clothes. It, it really was. Uh, and I still have both those shirts. You know, I, I, I run around the house in them. You know, they're, my, they're my pals now. So I, I, re, I really like that I did that. I, I, I was able to feel them uh, and, and believe in them a little more. 
That's um, that's a great uh, way to, to deal with it. Now, I know we only have a few minutes left, so I want to ask you, what are you reading right now? And um, would you recommend that book? If not, uh, tell us a book that you've read recently and that you'd strongly recommend it to our viewers. Oh, my goodness. That is a really good question because I'm an avid reader. I'm on target for about 100 books this year. Um, wow. I read the Puma years. Uh, did you read that one? I have not. I have not. I can't think of who the author is right now, but it's not a fiction. It's nonfiction. It's about a young girl who's kind of wayward. She doesn't know what she wants to do in her life. She's uh, working, not working, working, not working. So she volunteers to, to go down into South America and uh, to work at this wild animal refuge. And this is, this is her life-changing event. And it's called the Puma Years. And I really liked that one. I thought it was very well written. Um, she, you know, she's out there now uh, being very productive as a result of her experience in this, in the jungle, taking care of a wild puma. So I do recommend that well, one. Your timing couldn't be better because the next talk show is on a book about conservation, about saving rhinoceros in oh Africa. So um, I, that's what I'm planning to discuss uh, next um, for the next show. But I'm thinking I should read the Puma years on the side as well to complement or enhance that discussion. So thank you. Because it's a band of young people who have no training. They're all just wayward people. And they go and they live in the jungle and there's these there's these monkeys that cause all kinds of problems. There's these birds that cause all kinds of problems. There's tigers. There's this. There's that. Uh, every kind of wild animal. There's a pig, I think, even in involved in it that likes to steal the women's uh, underwear and bras. And, you know, it's very it, it, it's a very it, it's very funny. But it's also uh, I mean, you really feel the leeches on her legs, uh, you know, because that's what happens. They're in the jungle. It, it's wet. It's moist every second of the day. So I, I thought she wrote it really, really well. I, I, I have to say I really enjoyed that book. But my favorite of, above all in the 17 years as a moderator for the West Nile Book Club, though, is Pope Joan. I have to just put that out there. <laughs> Pope Joan. <laughs> Pope Joan. That, um, you know, again, I, I've enjoyed that book club so much. Um, it. Um, it saved me basically uh, in many ways because it challenged me intellectually and offered me a, an avenue for wonderful discussions. So, well, Elaine, thank you again for joining me today and for talking about your book. And um, until we meet again, and ahui ho. Ahui ho. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.